At this point, we know quite a bit about how atoms form covalent bonds within molecules to remain close to one another. One thing that remains to be explored is how the connections between atoms lead to a three-dimensional structure. In this series of videos, we're going to look at one theory that allows us to reason from the Lewis structure of a molecule, how its atoms are connected via covalent bonds to its three-dimensional structure, its three-dimensional molecular geometry. The theory is known as the valent shell electron pair repulsion or VSEPR theory, and we're going to dive into its foundational details and look at some examples in this series of videos. So let's begin with the foundations of VSEPR theory. One of the first things to notice is that molecules are three-dimensional. So you see three examples of molecules down here at the bottom of the slide, and certainly the molecule on the left has some three-dimensionality to it. There are bonds coming out towards us, CH bonds coming out towards us, and an OH bond coming towards us, and there are some CH bonds going away from us as well. So we can note, in general, that molecules are three-dimensional. And the three-dimensional structures of molecules profoundly affect their physical and chemical properties. As you move further on and take organic chemistry, you'll learn about stereochemistry, which is the study of how the spatial properties of molecules and the spatial properties alone dictate physical and chemical properties. We'd like to be able to predict three-dimensional structure, of course, given information just about how atoms are connected to one another. And Vesper theory is a sort of bridge between Lewis structures and molecular geometry that allows us to do this. The most essential foundational idea of Vesper theory is that electron clouds repel one another, and this should make a lot of sense in light of Coulomb's law, right? Coulomb's law says that the energy between two charged particles is proportional to the product of their charges divided by the distance between them, and so when the two charges are the same, the energy is greater than zero, and we should expect repulsion. Electrons are negatively charged and thus repel one another. The Pauli exclusion principle plays a role here as well. Remember that the Pauli principle says that two electrons within a molecule cannot have the same set of quantum numbers. The punchline is that electron clouds within molecules prefer to be as far from one another as they can possibly get. More specifically, it's repulsion between the valence electrons, the electrons in the highest energy shell, which participate in bonding and drive molecular geometry. The core electrons, which in atoms are completely filled, form basically inner spherical shells of negative electron density. And because those inner core shells are spherical, they don't affect molecular geometry. So now we see why the model is called valent shell electron pair repulsion. Moving from a Lewis structure to a molecular geometry is just a matter of identifying where the electron clouds are in space and then placing them as far apart from one another as we can possibly get them. Let's get into a little more detail on how Vesper theory defines an electron cloud. Electron clouds, or what we will more formally call electron groups, are collections of electrons that are situated close to one another in space. There are two types that we can think of. There are lone pairs, pairs of electrons that are non-bonding, not participating in bonding, and there are bonding electrons, which we find between two atoms, say A and B, in generally kind of a cylindrical type of shape. Note that we treat multiple bonds as a single electron group, a single contiguous region of space where electrons are likely to reside. So a double bond between A and B is also treated as a single electron group. And a triple bond between A and B is likewise treated as a single electron group. The insight of Vesper theory is that, subject to some approximations, the number of electron groups around an atom dictates the geometry at that atom because of this repulsive force between electron groups that we've already identified. So then, to determine the geometry of a molecule, all we need to do is count its number of electron groups to determine the number of electron groups around the atom, or what we'll more formally call the steric number. Let's look at a couple of examples to practice counting electron groups. So the first is phosphorus pentachloride, or PCl5. In PCl5, the phosphorus atom is sitting at the center. It's the least electronegative of the five and there are five chlorines sitting around the phosphorus atom and connected via single bonds to the phosphorus atom. So this is phosphorus pentachloride right here. And just to be careful, I will add in the lone pairs around each chlorine atom 
and these are non-bonding electrons at each chlorine. They're localized on chlorine, so they don't affect the geometry at the phosphorus atom, which will be our primary point of focus here, since the chlorines only have one bond, and so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to talk about the geometry at the chlorine atoms. What we can notice is that each single bond counts as an electron group, and so we have one, two, three, four, five single bonds to the phosphorus atom, and a total of five electron groups. Simple as that. Let's look at the second example, formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is H2CO, and the carbon is sitting at the center of this structure, surrounded by the oxygen and two hydrogens. The oxygen forms a double bond to the carbon so that it satisfies the octet rule, and so this is the Lewis structure of formaldehyde. If we look at formaldehyde, each of the CH bonds counts as a single electron group, so we get two electron groups out of those, and remember that we count the CO double bond as a single electron group. And so in total, we find three electron groups around the carbon in formaldehyde. And remember that we refer to this number, 5 and 3, as the steric number. 